during our time together here, if God wills and with God's help, uh, we're going to be going through the book of Haggai, which is a very neglected book. And uh, it, it is a book that I believe is tremendously uh, relevant for our day and age today. The prophets speak to us. The Word of God speaks to us and is very relevant for us every time we open it. And I believe that Haggai has a very strong but encouraging message for his church today. And I think that as we study it, we will see all the applications that God has for us in our lives in terms of how we ought to be living, especially in these last days before Jesus' return. Uh, this evening, before we begin our study in the book of Haggai, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. O Lord, I come to thee tonight, thirsty for thy Holy Spirit, for thine anointing, for thy words to touch my lips. O God, send out thy light and thy truth tonight and help that thy word will go forward and it will make an impression upon us that will never be effaced, that we will be drawn closer to Christ as we sit at his feet and as we study his word through the prophet Haggai, that we will understand the time that we're living in and the things that must be done in these last days. O oh God, give me a burden and a passion and a zeal as I preach thy word tonight. And may our hearts be tender and may thy word be flame to light us up with the zeal of love and fervency to serve Christ and to represent him in this world. I thank thee, Lord, for what thou art about to do. And I ask all these things in the wonderful and holy and precious and loving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. We are living in a day and age very similar to Haggai's day. A day of lingering between Babylon and Jerusalem. It is a day of lukewarmness toward the things of God. It is a day of insatiable materialism and emptiness. And God, through the prophet Haggai, has a message for us that is vital. Consider your ways. Consider your ways. This phrase is mentioned often in the book of Haggai, and it is mentioned for a reason. The term in the Hebrew literally means place these things or put these things into your heart. Consider your ways. And that word for ways is your actions, your way of living, your lifestyle. Determine these things. Consider them carefully. Let us look at th this aspect of consider thy ways tonight in three areas as we study chapter 1 of the book of Haggai this evening. We want to look at indifference, God's intervention, and inspiration. Verses 1 and 2. Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And the word of God says, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. The people were saying at this time, that it wasn't time to build the Lord's house, the sanctuary. And why were they saying that? Well, let's look at the history, the historical context of Haggai for a moment. After Cyrus had taken over Babylon and the Medo-Persians had ruled, he died. And during the time of Cyrus, of course, he had made some decrees for the people of God to return to their land. But after his son Cambyses took the throne the building that was supposed to have started, started to slow down. And as a result of it slowing down, the people started to become lethargic about rebuilding for God. And then another king came into the picture, and his name was False Smyrdis. And when False Smyrdis came into the picture, he basically was a king 
whom the enemies of Israel could convince to put a stop to the building of Jerusalem. And that's what they did. He made a stop to it. And as soon as a decree was passed stopping the building, the people looked at that as an opportunity to say, well, I guess we don't have to build right now. I guess we can stop. And as Israel was building, and don't forget, the, the, this was a result of the 70-year prophecy, right? They had gone to Babylon, Babylonian captivity, because they had disobeyed God. They'd walked away from His truth. They'd stopped keeping His commandments. They had become idolaters. They had done all these terrible things against God. And God took them and put them in Babylon. He allowed His enemies to take them over. And He said in Jeremiah 25 and also in Jeremiah 29.10, He had told them, that for 70 years you're going to be in Babylon, then I will release you. And guess what? Exactly to the day they were released. They went into captivity in 606, 605 BC. They came out in 536 and began actually building. But now the prophecy in Haggai occurs in 520. So what happened from the time they started building to 520? They stopped. They stopped because of this decree. And the devil had used many things to hinder the rebuilding of the temple. Notice what it says in Nehemiah chapter 4. The wall and the temple as they began to build when they first got back from Babylon, they started by building the wall. And notice what the devil tried to do to them to make them stop. In Nehemiah chapter 4 and beginning in verse 1, the word of God says, but it came to pass that when Sambalat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. So the first thing the devil tried to use was mockery. Have you ever been mocked for your faith? And as the last days progress, we will be mocked more and more for our faith. We will be made fun of more and more for what we believe and what we stand for. And I love Nehemiah's reaction because Nehemiah was not intimidated. Nehemiah knew where to go immediately when he faced mockery. And in the very next verse, Nehemiah prays. And he says, hear, O our God, for we are despised and turn their reproach upon their own head and give them for a prey in the land of captivity and cover not their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. They've dishonored thee, O God. So you take it up with them. And that's how we ought to be. We ought not to worry about what people say about us. Because it's not our reputation that's at stake. It's God's glory that is at stake. After we're finished here this weekend, you can say all manners of things against me. And you can come up with all kinds of things to find wrong with me. And you probably will. But that doesn't concern me. I didn't come here to be liked. I came here to preach the word of God. And if you love Jesus a little more by the time I've left here and love me a little less, well, that's fine with me for the time. And so when he faced the mockery, he did not do what normally would have been done. Human nature would have quivered and would have stopped. He prayed to God. And notice what else they tried to use. They tried to use intimidation. Notice in Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 11. Nehemiah 4 verse 11. And our adversaries said, They shall not know neither see till we come in in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they, they said unto us ten times, From all places whence ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. Interesting. Death threats. Ten times they were threatened with death. They'll come upon you and they'll kill you. Intimidation. Have you ever been intimidated for your faith? Yes. Many people have been intimidated for their faith. And, and you have two choices when you get intimidated for your faith. You can either stand for God or you can flee. The best thing to do is stand for God. And that's what they did here. They set up a watch. Notice, 
He says in verse 13, Therefore I set in the lower places behind the wall and on higher places. I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. He says, I put people on guard so that nobody could be able to come in and intimidate and take down what we were doing. Now, we ought to do the same today, but we don't use physical swords and bows. What swords do we use? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We have to be careful that we are watching. We are all watchmen on the walls of Zion. We all spend time in the Word of God. We are all guardians so that if we see something coming in that is against God's Word and against His truth, we ought to stand up to it. And Nehemiah did this. And therefore they were not able to come in. Notice what happened. It says, And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord which is great and terrible. And fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. Because it's a spiritual battle today that we're fighting. And we are fighting for our children. We are fighting for our families. We are fighting for our loved ones by keeping God's truth in His church. This is what needs to happen. So they were intimidated, but it didn't work. Notice verse 15. It came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, and God had brought their counsel to naught, that we returned all of us to the wall, everyone unto his work. God protected them because God is all-powerful, and he's almighty, and no enemy can stop him. And then they used false prophets in Nehemiah chapter 6. Nehemiah chapter 6, notice what it says there. It says in verse 2, Then Sambalat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono, but they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. So first they sent a message that said, let's meet in secret somewhere, and let's talk about this. Let's discuss this. Nehemiah says, look, I'm doing a great work for God. I don't have time to have this discussion. Because God's work is important. And the devil will do everything he can to get you off God's work. To, to get you off God's will. To get you off God's way. But you have to stand your ground and say, I'm not coming down to discuss something that is not profitable. Whatever discussion I have, it has to be about God. So often we waste our time talking about things that do not profit us after we're done talking about them. Have you noticed that? We'll have conversations with people. We'll run people down. We'll have gossip. We'll have all these kinds of things. We'll talk about money. We'll talk about materialism. We'll talk about... And at the end of the conversation, we have not been profited spiritually. We have not grown spiritually. God is telling us today, we need to talk about the things of God more often, especially as a people. And instead of running other people down, we ought to pray for them. Because it is then that God comes in and He begins to change our lives. So notice now they sent a false prophet and they, they basically said that, you know, all these things will happen as we go on with the account. It says, Then sent Sambalat his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time, in verse 5, with an open letter in his hand, wherein was written, It is reported among the heathen, and Gashmu saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel, for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king according to these words. And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah, and now shall it be reported to the king according to these words. Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. Then I sent unto them, saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. And they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work, that it be not done. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. False prophecy. That he was going to be a king. He wasn't planning to be a king. They were making things up. But what did Nehemiah do? Nehemiah stood his ground. And when he became afraid and thought his hands were going to be weakened, what did he do? He prayed, Oh God, strengthen my hands. And tonight when we pray that prayer in faith, God will give us strength to do his work. Notice now what happens. Afterward I came into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehatbiel, who was shut up, and he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night they will come to slay thee. 
Now they're going to kill you in the middle of the night. All these creative threats that are coming. And what did Nehemiah say? And I said, should such a man as I flee, and who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Now when he says, should such a man as I flee, he's not saying that he was more important than anybody else. He's saying, look, what I'm doing here is for the glory of God. If I run to hide in the temple, how will God's glory look? And he says, I'm not doing it. Notice now what happens. And lo, I perceived that God had not sent him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid to do so and sin, that they might have matter for an evil report, and they might reproach me. My God, think about Tobiah and Sambalat according to these their works, and on the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. So there were false prophets that were actually making false prophecies. We have to be so careful with that today. Because everybody thinks they have a new doctrine or a new belief or a new this or a new that. We're not here for something new. We're here to establish something old. Look at the old ways, God says. Establish the old paths. We have to begin living and loving and proclaiming what we believe, not trying to find something new. We have enough to think about with what God has already revealed. And we have enough to think about with following what God has revealed. And we have enough to think about and to do with proclaiming this beautiful message to the world. So all these things were happening. Intimidation, mockery, manipulation. Then there was a false ecumenical movement in Ezra. Notice this one. Ezra chapter 4. Ecumenicalism is not that new (laughs) it's been around for a while Ezra chapter 4 notice now when they were going to build the temple later on it says in verse 1 now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them let us build with you for we seek your God as ye do and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Ezarhaddon king of Ashur, which brought us up hither. So now the Samaritans came in, the adversaries, and they said, look, let's build with you because we believe the same thing. So let's not dwell on our differences. Let's dwell on our commonalities. Let's work together. Does that sound familiar? Oh, yes. That's happening right now. What did Zerubbabel do? Bless his heart. Zerubbabel and Jeshua, the high priest at that time, and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. Exclusive, intolerant, but godly. Because there's a time to be exclusive. And there's a time to be intolerant. Especially if the work of God will suffer as a result of being tolerant and being inclusive, then we must be exclusive. Then we must be firm. Then we must stand for God's truth. So all these things were happening then. Now let me ask you, are all these things happening today? That's why I took the time to show you this, so that you can see that in the context of Haggai's time, everything that was happening then to impede the building of the walls and the temple is happening today. Exactly the same. So is this prophecy relevant? Absolutely. It is relevant to our time today. And notice now what happened. So once the decree was passed that they could no longer build by false smirtis, now we go back to Haggai. And now the word of the Lord comes to Haggai. And the word of the Lord to Haggai says what? It begins with a quote. Not a quote from God, but a quote from the people. And in Haggai chapter 1, in verse 2, it says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. God now quotes the people and what they're saying. Why is he doing that? The Spirit of Prophecy tells us in Prophets and Kings, page 573, that for over a year, the temple was neglected and well nigh forsaken. 
The people dwelt in their homes and strove to attain temporal prosperity, but their situation was deplorable. Work as they might, they did not prosper. The very elements of nature seemed to conspire against them. Because they had let the temple lie waste, the Lord sent upon their substance a wasting drought. For one year, that temple stood unbuilt. The word of the Lord came to the governor, Zerubbabel, to the high priest, to the leaders, men who would hear it. And it reveals the attitude of the Israelites at this time, indifference to the things of God. Notice their logic. It's not time yet to build the temple. But let me ask you, what was the temple for? What was the purpose of the temple? The purpose of the temple was, was fourfold. Number one, it represented the presence of God. For God had said in Exodus 25, 8, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may what? Dwell among them. It represented God's presence. And wherever God's presence is, there's fullness of joy. And his, at His right hand, there are blessings evermore. So why wouldn't you want God's presence to be there? And He says, build me that temple. But they said, no, we won't build the temple. We'll build our houses instead. Second purpose of the temple was the temple represented the proper and godly and biblical worship of God. It represented how we ought to approach God with reverence and godly fear and how we ought to approach God with respect and with joy and with gratitude and how we ought to approach God with carefulness because He is holy and we are not. And how we come to God so that we can gain forgiveness of our sins. Every time they brought that lamb or that animal to the temple, they had to see an innocent animal die because of their sins. And it brought in, it, it, it was supposed to, to, to bring to them gratitude and forgiveness and, 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 and an appreciation for God. So the worship of God is vital. But what were the Israelites saying? No, we'll focus on our households. Today the same problem, my dear brothers and sisters, my beloved. The same problem. We do not worship God as often as we ought. The worship of God is not only for one day a week or two days a week. The worship of God is for every day a week. We are to gather our families together. We are to pray. We are to praise God. And as we, as we take down the altars of media and as we take down the altars of television and of computers and of entertainment and as we erect the altar of prayer in our homes, things will begin to change. The very atmospheres of our homes will begin to change and the peace of God which passeth all understanding will enter therein. The Israelites were saying, no, we need time to build our houses. We don't have time for worship, just like today. And as a result, everything that they did failed. It had no fruit. It had no result. Thirdly, the temple represented the plan of salvation and sanctification. When someone sinned, they had to go to the temple. They had to bring a lamb so that they could gain forgiveness. And every year in the Day of Atonement, the, the, the sins of the year were wiped clean. How important is it to gain forgiveness? We can't live without it, can we? But the Israelites were saying, no, forgiveness is not important as important as having a comfortable house. And having a comfortable life. And you know what? After all, when the temple is built, we'll get forgiveness. That's like saying today, when Jesus comes, we'll get forgiveness. Too late. Too late. The temple also represented, the, appointed to the Lamb of God, who was to come to dwell with us, to take away the sin of the world, to be our high priestly intercessor and our soon coming king. He ever liveth to make intercession for us in the most holy place right now. And the children of Israel at that time were saying, we don't need an intercessor. We can do it on our own. Let's just focus on our houses and on our lands and on our comfort and on our joys. Forget about that stuff. But we cannot make it without an intercessor. We cannot make it without Christ. We cannot be changed. We cannot be prepared for the coming of Christ if we don't point our minds heavenwards like we sang tonight. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. But what does that mean? What is the investigative judgment all about? It is a preparation for Christ's coming. It is a confession of our sins. It is the putting away of sin now while we still can 
before probation closes. So we don't have time to be playing around. And Israel, in effect, was saying that. They were saying, look, it doesn't matter. When it's built, it'll be done and everything will be taken care of. And in the end, they found only dryness. And the sanctuary, fourthly, represented prophecy. Teaching of the second coming. The teaching of what the God's plan for the universe. And today, we neglect prophecy to our peril. Because we need to realize the time that we're living in but not only do we need to realize the time that we're living in, but we need to be ready for the time that we're living in. You notice that the Bible says that God will send them strong delusions so that they could believe a lie because they had not a love for the truth. It doesn't say because they had not the truth. It's not the truth only that we need to have, but we need to have a love for the truth. Because you can know the truth, and many Adventists in the end of time, they will go after Satan knowing that it is Satan personating Christ. Why? Because they loved something else more than Christ. And Satan will give them that. If you and I love anything else more than the truth, and the way, the truth, and the life, Satan will use it to get us off Christ. And that's why it's so important for us Tonight, that we not only know what's coming, we not only know what we believe and why we believe it, but we love the things that we believe. We prize them above everything else, even our very lives, because they are precious to us. Notice that the temple had to be built first, and this was 520 B.C., and God was giving them all this time, because in 457 B.C., what would happen? The prophecy would start. The 70-week prophecy would start. Their 490-year probation would start. And God wanted them to make, wanted to make sure that that temple was built and that His worship was established so that the generations that keep coming now would be ready for Christ to come. Because it says He would bring in everlasting righteousness. He would anoint the most holy. But He wanted them to build that temple first. And He gave them so much time and now they were pausing. They were lukewarm. They were resting on their laurels. They were sitting back and saying, it's not a problem. Prophecy hasn't even activated yet. We have plenty of time. It's like when I hear people saying today, well, when we start hearing about the Sunday law, then we'll get serious about it. Too late! When we actually see these things coming to pass, it will be too late. We need to start preparing now because we have our lives to present before God. Sanctification, we're told in the spirit of prophecy, is not the work of a moment. It's the work of a lifetime. So we have no time to lose, do we, beloved? Every moment that God has given us is precious, and we have to redeem the time because the days are evil. And so this was very important. What could be more important then than building the Lord's house? For us today, building the Lord's house means to put God first. Notice, they say it's His house, but is it not for them? Wasn't the sanctuary for them? God didn't need to build the sanctuary. He did it for them, but yet they're saying that the Lord's house, the Lord's house, it's not just the Lord's house, it's also your house. They were not taking that holy ownership, if you will, to say that this is also for us. We say it's His truth, but is the truth not for us? Were not all these things done for us? Did not Christ come to die for us? Were we not given this precious Bible for us so that we can love it and live it? What's more important today than building for God? And today for the Christian, building for God means this. Notice what it says in Jude Verses 20 and 21. Jude, verses 20 and 21. Notice what it says there. Jude only has one chapter, verses 20 and 21. What does it say that we ought to be building as Christians today? Which is the anti-typical application of building the temple. But ye beloved, building up yourselves on what? On your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost, 
Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. This is what we ought to be building today. Therefore, to build the Lord's house was to build themselves up, to keep themselves in the presence, the worship, the plan, the love of God through Jesus Christ. And what could be more important than this? What could be more important than learning to pray in the Holy Spirit? To pray in the Holy Spirit, you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that is assisting your prayers. To be filled with the Holy Spirit, you have to be emptied of self and pride and ego and anything that would impede you from allowing the Holy Spirit to dwell within. Keep yourselves in the love of God. And what is the love of God? It's not a fuzzy-wuzzy feeling. It's not just an emotion. It's a principle of holiness. It's the power of Christ to live a righteous life and a humble life before Him. Keep yourselves in the love of God. And what are you been looking for? The mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. This is what we ought to be building today. We can build anything else, but if we don't build this, everything else will fall apart. Everything else will be useless. Everything else will not last. It will have no value. Ellen White tells us in manuscript 116, 1897, says that even the people that should have been the most interested continue to be indifferent. They misapplied the prophecy given by inspiration. They misinterpreted the word of God and declared that the time to build had not yet come and that until the days were fully accomplished, they would not undertake the work. And aren't we doing that today? Not time yet. Take it easy, relax. Souls are perishing for want of the truth. The very thing you and I have been given, beloved, the very truths that we have been given that have changed our lives, there are people waiting out there to hear those truths. And are we building for that? Are we focusing on that? Are we harnessing on that? Or are we misinterpreting just like the Israelites were at this time, the Word of God, and even making declarations that it's not time yet? And it says, but while they left the building of the house of the Lord, the temple in which they could worship God until the end of time, specified as the captivity of the Jews had fully come, they built mansions for themselves. Isn't that interesting? A misapplication of prophecy and a misapplication of urgency, which is what we need to have in these last days. We need a sense of holy urgency. People ask, you know, how come the disciples were thinking that Christ was going to come in their time? Because they wanted Him to come. Even though, come Lord Jesus. But when they wrote in the scriptures, they knew that so certain things had to happen before He came. But every generation of, of sincere and zealous believers in Christ have always been urgent about His coming. You hear people saying today, oh, it's been 2,000 years and He hasn't come. You haven't been waiting 2,000 years. How long have you been waiting? 30, 40, 50, 60? But yet, we have to have that sense of urgency. Why? Because we want Him to come. We want Him to come. And we want to do the work so that we can hasten His coming. We want to finish the work. And so this spiritual indifference uh, expresses itself in the statement, My Lord delayeth His coming. And what do we begin to do? And it manifests itself in procrastination and then a love for materialism and then an entry into worldliness and then ungodliness and then faithlessness and then we become scorners of the things of God. And so many people have taken that pathway because they've just relaxed. There is no relaxing in the kingdom of God. There's no stopping. We either go forward or we backslide. Once we stand still, we begin to backslide. There's no standing still in the things of God. We ought to move forward. And so, beloved, consider your ways today. Is God really first? Or are you and I making excuses because the world is the way it is? Oh, we live in a postmodern world. Guess what? It's sinful. It's always been sinful. You can put any label you want on it. It doesn't make a difference. In the undercurrent roots, it's sin. And it needs the gospel just like it always has. So we make the excuse today, oh, the world is not the way it used to be. 
Yes, it is. It's still sinful. They still hate the Word of God. They still hate hearing about God. But you know what? The Holy Spirit is just as powerful today to convict hearts and impress hearts and draw hearts to the Savior. The Word of God is just as powerful today to speak to the hearts of people and to break the hard hearts of sinful men and to bring them to the knowledge of the truth. Are you making excuses because you say you need to make a living? Yes, we all need to make a living. We all have bills to pay. We all have work to do. But our primary work is depending upon God. Because God's word says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto thee. Is it because it does not look like it's time? Is it because you're looking at the world and you're being fooled with what the devil is putting out there that, you know, things are not that bad? They're not as bad as they seem. You hear people saying that. It's not as bad as it looks. It's actually better today. Look at our technology. Look at the, the, the way things have grown and have happened in the world. It's worse because the Bible says it's worse. And I believe God before I'll believe any man or I'll believe my own eyes. I'll believe God's word. Amen? Is there not a cause tonight? And the cause is the one thing needful. And what is the one thing needful? The one thing needful is the one thing needed. It is to sit at the feet of Christ. Because when we begin to sit at the feet of Christ like Mary did, and we begin to hear His voice, and we begin to have His leading, and we begin to be captivated by His matchless charms, it is then that He changes us from the inside out. It is then that He gives us the power to go out and to do His will. It is then that He gives us the fearlessness and the courage that Nehemiah had to be able to pray through that building of the wall. And now we come to the intervention part. Verse 3. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? Now God shows them the reasons and the consequences of their actions and their motives. That word sealed in the Hebrew means to be covered in with wood. In other words, to garnish and to adorn the house. It's not that God didn't want them to have shelter when they came back from Babylon. Of course He did. He didn't want them living out in the wilderness. He wanted them to have a shelter. But the thing is, when they made those shelters up in their basic fragments, they were then to go straight to the temple because that was to be the priority. Because then they were to gain there the presence and the power of God to do everything else that they had to do. But now they started building the houses more and more fancier. And as in effect, God is saying, your houses are more important than the house of God. Your houses are roofed and cleaned and elegant and rich. God's house is run down, cheap and falling apart. And isn't that the case today? The things of God are not respected. The church of God is not respected. Everything in this church, everything in this church is for the work of God and should be treated with reverent and clean hands. Just the way you treat your house and you make sure your house is clean and wonderful and, 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 and spotless, that's the same way we ought to be with the church. Amen? In everything that we treat, even down to the hymnal, anything that we handle has to be handled with respect because it belongs to God's work. Amen? But not only is the, the building uh, referenced here, but to God's work. How do we do God's work? And in many cases, God's work is done in a slipshod manner, beloved. We don't really zealously prepare for God's work the way we prepare for a vacation. The way we prepare for our pleasures. The way we prepare for the things that we like to do. You notice when you prepare for your things, you make sure you've done your research. You make sure you know what the deal is, what, the, what it's going to cost, how we're going to do it, step by step. And you plan that vacation so well. But with the work of God, everything is last minute. Everything is slipshod. Everything is at the last. Why? Because that's where we've put God. That's why God tells them in Malachi and the prophets. He says, look, you, you, you bring the best fatted calf to your governor. But then when you come to the temple, you bring your offerings and their maim, their, their halt, and their blind. And those offerings represent Christ. And he says, bring it to your governor and see what he'll tell you. Bring that kind of work ethic to your boss and see if you'll still have a job in a week. 
See what I mean? And I know it's hard, brethren. We don't like hearing these things. But we need to hear them because it's true. Because we need to search our hearts. Because we need to see where we are and where we need to be. And God is saying here, look, you've left God's work undone. And your personal things, you take care of them very well. And this wasn't the first time that this happened. Notice what it says in Jeremiah chapter 22. And the sad thing about this is, is that in Jeremiah chapter 22, this was before the captivity. This, was, this passage was given before they went into Babylonian captivity. And before they went into Babylonian captivity, Jeremiah 22 verse 13, they had the same problem. Notice, what does it say there? It says, Woe unto him that doeth what? That buildeth his house by unrighteousness, and his chambers by wrong, that useth his neighbor's service without wages, and giveth him not for his work, that saith, I will build me a wide house, and large chambers, and cutteth him out windows, and it is sealed with cedar, and painted with vermilion. Shalt thou reign, because thou closest thyself in cedar? Did not thy father eat and drink and do judgment and justice? And then it was well with him. He judged the cause of the poor and needy. And it was well with, then it was well with him. Was not this to know me, saith the Lord? But thine eyes and thy heart are for, not but for thy covetousness and for to shed innocent blood and for oppression and for violence to do it. Isn't that sad? Before they went into captivity, they were doing the same thing. They were building for themselves. And God says, do you think you're a king now because you live in a big fancy house? Your fathers, what did they do? They lived in humble homes. They obeyed the voice of God. They did righteousness and they helped those that they needed to help. Isn't it a pity that 70 years of Babylonian captivity had taught them nothing in this area? And isn't it a pity with us when God patiently and long-sufferingly forbears with us for years and years and years. And he's such a merciful God. Because if you look back, how long has he been long-suffering with you and me? How long has he been calling out to you on a daily basis and saying, My son, my daughter, give me thine heart. And you've been saying, No, you can have everything else, Lord, but not my heart. And there are certain areas of my heart that you can't have because they belong to somebody else. But God is long-suffering with us, but His long-suffering is not eternal because we are not eternal. And there's going to come a day when His long-suffering is going to end. Isn't that right? So we have to appreciate when we hear His voice, act upon it. When we hear Him calling us in the morning to spend time with Him in prayer, put everything else aside and spend time with Him in prayer or in the middle of the day or whenever He calls upon us, and He wants to hear from us and He wants us to hear from Him. Turn to Him and spend that time with Him. See, it will change everything for you. Notice. Consider. Back to Haggai. Notice what he says here. Haggai chapter 1, verse 5. He says, consider your ways again. Ye have sown much, verse 6, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Oh. So now they were eating, and they weren't satisfied. Now they were buying clothing, and they didn't have enough clothes. They weren't satisfied. Does that sound familiar? Notice our materialistic age today. How many different types of foods you can have and yet people are not satisfied with food? How many different types of clothing styles there are and yet people are not satisfied with clothing? They're not satisfied with cars. They're not satisfied with anything. Why? Because God has been left out of the picture. And especially God's people need to take stock of this because we are especially guilty. And we need to realize the basic underlying spiritual uh, 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 thought that is coming out here in this verse. You will never be truly satisfied with anything until you are fully satisfied with God. You will never be truly satisfied with anything until you're fully satisfied with God. 
Solomon testifies of this in Ecclesiastes 5.10. He says, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. But in Jeremiah 31.4, it tells us where true satisfaction comes from. Jeremiah 31.14 says, My people shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. That's where satisfaction is. Consider then tonight, beloved, your dissatisfaction. Bring your sin to God and He will give you peace. Tell Him, Lord, I've tried everything. I've tried everything to bring me peace. I've tried everything to bring me happiness. I've tried everything else. But I haven't focused on Thee, O Lord. I've left Thee out of the picture. And I come to Thee to make it right tonight. Because I've tried everything else. I've even heard people telling me, they're going on vacation because they want to take a break from God. Are you kidding me? You can never take a break from God. He's everywhere. But yet we have that mindset. We may not vocalize it, but there are times when the world draws us out and we say, I need, I need to get away from it all. But we don't get away from it all. We go deeper into it all because we go into worldly things. And worldly things will never satisfy you. When I was out in the world and I wanted to get away from it all, I'd go down and chug a bottle of whiskey down. And guess what? When I'd wake up the next day after I'd thrown up several times and my head felt like it was going to explode, the problems were still there. But we do that too. We we'll say, oh, come on. I, I'm not going to read my Bible today. I'm not going to pray. I'm just going to go and do something fun. And guess what? We become weaker for where after we do that? Because what is our strength is Christ. Christ is our strength. And without Him, we can do nothing. So God is calling us today to consider ourselves, to bring these things to God, to be honest with God and to say, Lord, I have not truly tasted of Thee. I've tasted of everything else. And it's all full of holes. Verse 7, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountain. And bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts? Because mine house that is waste, mine ho because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine and upon the oil and upon that which the ground bringeth forth and upon men and upon cattle and upon all the labor of the hands. Consider your ways. Go up and build the house, he says. Just go up and build it. And then what will happen? I'll be glorified, he says. And when I'm glorified, then you will have true pleasure beyond your wildest dreams. Because when God is glorified, what happens? Put God in His house first, and He will be glorified and pleased. And when you please God, you release His pleasure and glory into your life, and you're truly pleased. That's what He was telling them. Do what you know you have to do. Go up and get the wood and build the house. My house is waiting. And so in the same sense today, He's telling us, go and build for the kingdom. Build character. Build Christ-like character for the kingdom and you will see that you'll be able to go through anything with Christ. Anything that comes your way. And then he says in verses 9 to 11, he says, when you brought these things home, you looked for much and it came to little. When you brought it home, what did God do? He blew upon it. He minimized it. He made it small. And the SDA commentary tells us here that evidently, the returning exiles had high hopes of peace and prosperity upon their return to Judah and were ill-prepared for the hardships that faced them. Why? Pointedly, the people are told that the failure of their crops is not due to natural causes, but to the God who controls the forces of nature, to Him whose house they had neglected. Now, this is interesting, isn't it? Because when they came out of Babylon, they figured, well, the prophecy's done. We're out of captivity now. Now we come back to our home, and now everything will just get taken care of. But they didn't, they didn't think they had to change anything here. See? This was the problem. 
And we do the same thing with the prophecies today. We say, well, things are going to be fulfilled just like it says they are, and we're Seventh-day Adventists, so God's going to work everything out. No, He's not. We have to be ready for what's coming. We have to be spiritually prepared for what's coming. We can't presume and say that just because we're Adventists, we're going to make it through because we know a few things. We've got to have Christ's righteousness in us or we're not going to make it through anything. doesn't matter how much we know. And it's good to know. Knowledge is good. The knowledge of God, the knowledge of the Word, the knowledge of the things of God. But we also need the power of God and the righteousness of Christ to be able to go through. This was a grand presumption that they made, and it was a very lethal presumption because they came back thinking everything was going to be okay. And then God said, you're not getting any crops. Nothing is growing, and everything that you're building for is minimized. So now what are you going to do? Now you need to realize you need to turn to God. And beloved, if anything that we do for God, any work that we do for God is going to have lasting value, it must be done in Christ. You've built a beautiful school here. And I love the way God has been working and what He's done. And I've heard the story and it's just, it, it, it's, it's given encouragement to my heart. But remember something, the school's there, the church is here, but we also have to build character, holy lives. Church is not going to, school's not going to run itself just because we built it. We need to be ready. We need to prepare our characters. We need to be sure that we're in Christ. So that the work that we do will have value or else God will just blow on it and it will become nothing. God is in control of everything. Your crops, your money, your health, your mind, your buildings, your work, everything. Thus in putting God last, you ruin yourself. In the world today, we think we are in control of our lives when in fact, were it not for God, we would be undone. For Lamentations 3.22 says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. Who is consumed in the Bible? According to Psalm 104.35, the sinners will be consumed. So if we're living in sin and in unrighteousness and in unholiness, there will come a consumption in our lives. Our, our, our love for Christ will be consumed. Our zeal for the Lord's work will be consumed. Sin will become like the water that puts the fire out to work for God. The Bible says in Isaiah 1.28 that they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed. When we turn our backs on God and we put Him last, we will be consumed. We will not be happy in anything. In Isaiah 16, 4, it says the oppressors will be consumed. When we oppress other people, when we run other people down, when we gossip against other people, when we mistreat other people, when we are unkind to other people, when we are unloving to other people, we are consumed and consuming ourselves with hate and with lust and with violence. And we are causing the Holy Spirit to leave, quenching Him and grieving Him. In Isaiah 29, 20, the scorner is consumed. One who mocks at the things of God. One who says, what is this guy preaching? What is he babbling about? What kind of thing is this about holiness? And they laugh at the things of God. They will be consumed. Because holiness is God's character that He wants to give to us to have. So we can be heavenly citizens. And in Isaiah 66, 17, it says that those who commit idolatry will be consumed. Whenever we put anyone or anything in the place of God, it consumes our love for Christ. It consumes our zeal for God. We become followers of men instead of followers of God. Woe worth the day that we make flesh our arm. Cursed be the man, the Bible says, that maketh flesh his arm. But blessed be the Lord that depends on the Lord. Blessed be the man that depends on the Lord. He will be blessed, right? He will be blessed. Don't go after people today. Don't follow after men today. We have Adventist groupies following people around today all over the place as if they're some kind of celebrities. Sinners all. We're here to follow Christ. We're here to pursue after Christ. We're here to pray for those men and, and ask God to give them the strength to do the work that they're doing. But we're never to idolize them and to place them in a position equal with God. Never. 
They are not going to give us comfort. They're not going to give us the answer. They are preachers of the Word of God. They are there to lead you to a closer walk with God. And when you have that closeness with God, then you will have the peace that you seek. Don't look for it in a man. You'll never find it. He'll never be able to give it to you. Thank God today that He is merciful and long-suffering. But He will not wait forever. Consider your ways, saith the Lord. Have you seen the futility of the world? Have you seen the futility of sin? Then turn to Christ. Turn completely to Christ and make Him your all. And thirdly and finally, inspiration. Now comes the good news. And notice what happens. In verse 12 of Haggai 1, the Bible says, Then Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Joshua the son of Josedek, the high priest with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people did fear before the Lord. Amen. Amen. They obeyed. They listened. They followed. Zerubbabel here who is a type of Christ, and we'll be looking at that tomorrow in the last presentation, was a godly governor and one that had considered his ways. Joshua was the high priest. And the remnant of the people, you know why it says the remnant of the people there? <laughs> because sadly enough, after the proclamations had come to leave Babylon, very few people left. In fact, the SDA Bible commentary says, a comparatively small number of exiles returned to Judah. See, they had become warm to Babylon. They had become comfortable in Babylon. And when that prophecy was fulfilled and they said, go back and build, their zeal was gone because it was in Babylon now. How careful ought we to be, beloved? We have been called out of Babylon. We have nothing to do with Babylon. But yet so often, there's still a little bit of Babylon in our hearts. And we have to get right with God so that there's none of that Babylonish influence left. Because they were trying to interpose their Babylonian living back into Judah. And that's why they were living comfortably. They were imitating what they had seen and what they had lived in Babylon, what they wanted in Babylon. And so the remnants are those who are involved, obedient, who fear the Lord, and who obey His word. Those people went back, and even though they saw nothing when they went back, it was dry, it was arid, it, it, it looked hopeless. They said, oh no, God has brought us back here. Let's do the work. Let's do the work. And God was gracious to them to raise up Haggai to tell them, build. Notice in verse 13, Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. The, the word of God never says anything superfluously. There's always purpose in it. It sounds obvious to us to read the Lord's messenger in the Lord's message. But think about what that means for a moment. We are to preach the Word of God. We are to teach the Word of God. We are to talk to others and witness to, to others about the truths that we have in the message. We ought to be in the message ourselves. How can you tell other people to fear God and give Him glory for the hour of His judgment has come when you and I don't fear God and when we don't give Him glory for anything and we don't even worship Him the way we ought to worship Him? The Lord's messenger must be in the Lord's message must be living the Lord's message. The remnant are a people who are few, but they're involved, they're obedient, they fear God, they respond to God's messages, and they live in God's messages. Because Haggai here, and it's, it's a word from God to Haggai, that he lived what he was preaching. And God helped me to live what I preach. And God helped you to live what you believe. And then he says, I am with you in that verse. And that is powerful. I am with you. God is with you, saith the Lord. As long as you remain obedient, as long as you continue to follow, as long as you continue to do what God is asking you to do, I am with you. You have that promise. Now I am with you. It says in the Spirit of Prophecy in Manuscript 116, 1897, it was after Haggai's second message that the people felt that the Lord was in earnest with them. They dared not disregard the repeated warning that their prosperity and the blessing of God were dependent upon their entire obedience to the instructions given them. As soon as they decided 
that they would do the words of the Lord, his messages of reproof changed to words of encouragement. But you got to have reproof before encouragement. Today, we're putting the cart before the horse. Today, we always want to talk to people about, oh, tell us about the love of God. Tell us about how wonderful we are. Tell us about how special we are, Pastor. Don't come here and, 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 and expose sin to us. We don't want to hear that. But the word of rebuke, how does God do it? The word of rebuke comes, and then the word of encouragement comes. Because the word of reproof brings repentance, it brings contrition, it brings confession, it brings a change, and then the word of encouragement can come and say, now I am with you. And isn't it encouraging after that? After you have seen yourself, brought your sins to Christ, now he can say, I am with you, I've forgiven you, I love you. You don't put the cart before the horse. People hear about the love of Christ and they don't know that they're sinners and they don't know how heinous and horrible a thing sin is. They're not going to appreciate the grace of Christ. They're not going to appreciate the love of God. They will trample it and that's exactly what they're doing today because these messages are coming in with encouragement, encouragement, encouragement. Nothing about reproof. Reproof must come first. That's how God does it. She says, oh, how merciful a God we have. He says, I am with you. The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. He assured the people that if they were obedient, they would place themselves in a position where he could bless them for his own name's glory. If God's people will only rely upon him and believe in him, he will bless them. Don't we want God's blessings tonight? The only way we can have them is by being obedient. Following what God has told us to do. What a word is this. If Christ be for us, who can be against us? And notice the last verse. <clears throat> and the Lord, verse 14 and 15, actually last two verses. Then the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, in the four and twentieth day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. When did this message come? In the first day of the month. 23 days later, they got it. <laughs> 23 days later, it hit home. God stirred up the hearts. Would to God tonight he would stir up our hearts to rise up and to prepare for the soon coming of Christ, to prepare characters that are fitted for heaven. God wants to be with us. God wants to save us. God longs to give us His righteousness. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 15, <clears throat> it gives us the principle. 2 Chronicles 15, 1 and 2. And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah the son of Oded. And he went out to meet Asa, and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you, while ye be with him. And if ye seek him, he will be found of you. But if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. Do you want God to be with you? Do you want God to bless you? Then you need to turn to him. You and I need to turn to him with all of our hearts closing story tonight comes from <clears throat> Thompson who wrote The Hound of Heaven I don't like the title much but the poem is amazing and the way that it was written is amazing this man who wrote it, Thompson, was running and running. He was running from his father, running from his failure as a medical student. He was running from God himself. Thousands have read The Hound of Heaven with tears, for it is the story of God's pursuit of all, who, like Thompson, reject him and try to flee from him. The poet knew that all things betray thee who betrayest me, but still he ran into the slums of London, into starvation, dirt, drug addiction, and disease. But why? For though I knew his love who followed, yet I was sore adread, lest having him, I must have nothing beside. Thompson need never have starved. In 1859, he was born into a well-to-do family. 
but his parents wanted him to become a physician, a career that he detested. He failed his exams three times and then he fled to London. He failed every occupation he tried. Although his father sent a little money to him in care of a library, he was refused admission because he was so shabby. When he collapsed in the street, a prostitute rescued him. Some poems he scribbled on sugar paper were printed by Wilford Maynell, who finally rescued Thompson. Under the care of a, of a Franciscan community, Thompson escaped his drug addiction, but his health was permanently injured. The author of what has been called the greatest ode in the English language died on November 13th, 1907. And I want to read you four sentences from this poem that are principles. And they exemplify what I've been trying to say tonight. The first one is, all things betray thee who betrayest me. When you betray God, you will be betrayed. When you are unfaithful to God, you will see unfaithfulness. You will experience it. Not shelters thee who will not shelter me. If you don't allow Christ to come and live within, you will never feel that sense of security that everybody's looking for. Because it's not found in pop psychology. It's not found in self-esteem. It's not found in all these things that don't do anything for it. It's found in Christ only. Lo, not contentest thee who contentest not me. Nothing will make you happy until you start making God happy. And then at the end he says, Ah, fondest, blindest, weakest, I am he whom thou seekest. Thou dravest love from thee who dravest me. You know, many of us have put him away like that. But he's been coming after us. And even when I didn't know him and I was addicted to drugs and alcohol, even when I didn't know him and I was in a place of despondency and despair where I even wanted to take my life, even when I didn't know him, he pursued me. He pursued me. And I thank God tonight that he pursued me. And I want to spend the rest of my life now pursuing him. And tonight, whoever you are, you may have lost touch with God. You may have let the busyness of life and the whirlwinds of life take over. And you may have left and abandoned the things of God. Tonight, God is calling you back. He's calling you to rise up and to build a character for the kingdom, a Christ-like character. What will you say to him tonight? What will be your answer to him? What will be your response? If you want to say, yes, Lord, yes, tonight I want to return. I want to return and I want to give thee my all. I've considered my ways tonight, and I see that I need thee in my life. If you want to say that tonight, whoever you are, I'm going to ask you to kneel wherever possible, and we're going to have a prayer together. <clears throat> and if you can't physically kneel, that's okay, but if you're physically able, and God has spoken to you through his word tonight, won't you kneel with me? <clears throat> oh, eternal and gracious Father, we thank thee for thy word tonight. Consider thy ways. And we have considered, dear Father, we have considered our hearts tonight and we have considered that we have abandoned Thee, we have forsaken Thee, we have turned from Thee, O Lord. <clears throat> and our heart has coveted after other things besides Thy things. And tonight we want to confess our sin before Thee. We want to ask Thee for Thy forgiveness, O Lord. Were anything that has taken the place of our time with Thee in building a Christ-like character, Anything has taken priority over that. We want to bring it to thee tonight. And we want to ask that thou give us victory. Give us cleansing. Give us repentance and forgiveness. And O oh Lord, help us tonight as we rise up from this place to build characters for thy kingdom. To build and to dwell in thy love and in thy righteousness and in thy word. To be consistent in our Christ-like character. To be zealous for thy truth so that we might be able to have that fervent love for thy truth that will transform us and everyone around us. Pray for this dear church, dear Father, and those who have come tonight, every single person. And as they have considered, O oh Lord, and as they go home tonight, reveal to them the things that they need to make right. And help us as we work on our hearts these next two days, by thy will and by thy help, that we will truly be drawn closer to thee, and we will truly turn from anything that is unlike thee, and turn to Christ, and love him above all, and serve him above all. For we ask all these things in Jesus' most blessed and holy and wonderful name. Amen.